What about entrepreneurship? How do you think AI improves the process? It's going to explode it. And there was Sunny Madra. Sunny Madra. Sunny Madra is here. My guy, Sandeep Madra from Definitive Intelligence, a serial entrepreneur, and one of the smartest, most fun guys I know. He is going to tell you everything you need to know about AI and how to apply it to your daily life. We're in this age of you know, digital transformation, or a lot of things are changing. Very hard technical problems from the past that have become almost trivialized in today's world. What everyone should think about is the speed at which you can move in this environment. And if you're not leveraging AI, you're going to get killed. If you were starting an AI company today, what would you do? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Welcome to today's episode of Vinny Vidi Vici. Uh, we have an amazing guest in the studio today, Sunny Madra, and he is going to tell you everything you need to know about AI and how to apply it in your daily life and even some insights into what you could have done with it in the past that, that was not possible then, but is possible now. And we're going to have a ton of hints and tips. So if you're deep into the AI space, I really, really encourage you to watch this video, leave a comment below, like it, and please subscribe to my channel. Sunny, welcome. Oh, good to, good to be here, Vinny. It's yeah. awesome. Really want to congratulate you on this amazing setup and the new show and Super excited. We're getting the team back together. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's been a while since we've been on a podcast together. Yeah. One well, and, and look, remember our our starting was the on the call in app. Yeah. So yeah. I remember that. We've really kind of evolved fr from there to this amazing setup. We had the Crypto Musings uh we did. audio podcast. We did. And then we uh and then we moved to the J Cal show. We, we had the J Cal show in <laughs> crypto and then Crypto sort of slowed down a little bit. Yeah. And, then and then we pivoted to AI. AI, yeah. And then now, you know, you're still doing AI with JK. I'm still doing the show with him, yeah. which is every really week, fun. which is we amazing. We miss you there. We got to have you back. No, on. That's good. I'm too busy recording these I episodes. I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you, you, know, you did the right thing. You have your own show. But it was good to have you on. And yeah. I'm sure a lot of people will be uh, happy to hear from from the two of us, yeah. uh, you know, as uh, if they were familiar with us in the past. So that's good. For sure. Um, well, look, uh, let, let's just start off by. Um, giving you know a little bit of your background. How sure. how did you get to your, to where you are today? Um, obviously, you're you're now living in the Bay Area. Thank yeah. you for coming down to San Diego. For sure, for sure. Um, you know, the, the weather's yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's a, it's an attraction. Um, but uh, you know, I want to dig into your past. You're yeah. Canadian, so yeah. let's let's start there. So where were you born? Yeah. And you know, how did you get into tech? Yeah, um, born in a small town about three hours outside of Toronto, but border city to Detroit called Windsor. And it's an automotive town because it's so close to Detroit. Um, you know, from there went to university in Ottawa, mm -hmm. uh, studied computer engineering, mm -hmm. and it was there during sort of the tech boom, original tech boom in ninety nine. Uh, yeah, well, even yeah. before like ninety six, oh, yeah. ninety seven, right? And so okay. as things were getting started, and um, you know, had a kind of taste of working with both with startups and with kind of companies that were up and coming during that time, like Cisco, mm -hmm. um, and really started my career working and actually in like computer networking and, and hardware and chips, which is interesting is kind of coming back around the latest era. Um, you know, from after I graduated, I moved down to the Bay Area, um, worked for a startup that was acquired by Cisco, mm -hmm. and then ultimately was there for a couple years during the nuclear winter, mm -hmm. the you know two thousand one yeah. to you know two three, and then left Cisco in two thousand five to start um, to actually we spun some technology out of Cisco, a company called Semaphore, which was like creating tools for chip development, mm -hmm. and a couple of my coworkers wanted to you know build a company there, so I, I left with them to start that, but I had a real passion to you know, build um, kind of internet software because I was really close on the hardware side. Um, and you know, as entrepreneurs, sometimes you always want to do things you're not currently doing. Exactly. And uh, so after we, you know, we got that company off the ground and um, actually congratulations to those guys. They were acquired earlier this year in January. So ultimately it was Amazing. a good run for, for that business as well and had a bit of equity. So okay, it, was, it was fun. But I, I then uh, went on an entrepreneurial journey and I met Rob Mee, who was the founder of Pivotal, uh, Pivotal Labs at mm -hmm. that point. And what was really interesting was for me, they were doing software consulting, mm -hmm. but they were using kind of methods in like XP, that like extreme programming mm -hmm. that I had not really seen in practice in any part of my career, definitely read about in textbooks. This and, is like the era of agile programming. Well, exactly. It was exactly. agile programming, pair programming. Pair and so, yeah. you know, they had built a incredible practice used by startups mm -hmm. all through the Bay Area, great reputation. And I had actually met them through a startup I was doing some work with. 
And I got so intrigued by how they were building software, I wanted to build my own version of Pivotal Labs. And so I went to Rob, who's now a great friend, um, and has started a new business, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, I said, hey, Rob, I want to do this, but I'm going to do it in mobile. And he said, mm -hmm. sure, I'll, I'll help you. I'll kind of give you the format of how to start it. And so we, um, you know, kind of, I, I, with a good friend of mine, Amar Varma, we started Extreme Labs, mm -hmm. which was focused around, you know, agile and XP development for mobile apps. And this is before the iPhone came out. So we were doing oh, wow. it for BlackBerry. So you like JTME stuff? Yeah, exa and, exactly, yeah. right? And so, and then the iPhone came about six months after we started, and we were <laughs> One of the first developers on the platform, we basically made um, some really interesting demo apps for ourselves. So you saw the platform shift coming, yeah, from, from you know the previous devices to Apple, yeah, and you pivoted your whole business within a few months. Yeah, and as soon as like like I said, the SDK came out where you mm -hmm. could launch your own apps, we launched our own, and that gave us credibility to work with businesses that wanted to build because mm -hmm. you know there was nobody that had experience other than folks that had built their own. Mm -hmm. And that put us on a really solid journey. And, you know, by the time we sold that business, which was in 2013, you know, we had made hundreds of apps that were downloaded billions of times. And customers ranged from Facebook to Uber to NFL to the NBA. Amazing. There was like, even Apple was our customer at one point. Okay. You know, we had built like an app store for them that they used in commercials. And so... You it guys, was, I remember you guys were the, the go-to company to build apps. For apps, yeah, yeah. we were. And How many employees did you have? Like 200, 300? Started with two of us, me and Ummer, and then when we sold, we were about 350. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was amazing growth. Yeah. It was, in how many years? Three or four years? No, we started uh, like at the beginning of 2008, and we okay. sold in 2013. Five years. Five years? Yeah, okay. five years. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. Amazing growth. Yeah. And, you know, what, what, you know, things go full circle, and, you know, Rob's company, Pivotal Labs, <clears throat> had been acquired by EMC. Mm -hmm. And they were then, EMC was taking a bunch of assets um, and spinning them out as a new company called Pivotal, same name but a mm -hmm. different concept. Where there was a consulting business, there was a data platform, and there was a cloud platform, a platform as a service called Cloud Foundry. And so Rob had kind of looked to us and said, "Hey, we got to have more presence in mobile." And we were obviously kind of in, in the tops there. And so we ended up uh, getting acquired by Pivotal <laughs> to bolster that. And then at Pivotal, I ran the data business uh, for a while. And so we grew that, and so it was an interesting run. And there, um, you know, we ended up um, in, you know, just kind of sharing these stories mm -hmm. for folks, hopefully they're valuable, but we were at a sales kickoff. So you're in a, in a big company, you have mm -hmm. these like yearly sales kickoffs and you bring in large customers. And what happened was uh, our CEO at the time, who was Paul Moritz, <clears throat> he was telling a bunch of automotive customers, mm -hmm. hey, you guys should build your own cloud and have a common format because all cars are gonna become connected. Mm -hmm and or autonomous over time. So you need to have like a kind of a standard uh, system so you're not all doing it yourselves. And we kind of sat there and said, this is a really good idea and these automotive mm. companies aren't gonna do it. <laughs> exactly. So we should do it. And then, you know, as we got that off the ground, you know, Ford was an investor. Yeah. And then they- well, just, just for, for context and background. Yeah. When you started that company, you actually took space in my office. Yeah. In it, Palo Alto. It, it, yeah, you, exactly. We were looking for office space and then yeah. Yeah, I, I came to you, and you had some extra space. Yeah, and you it was in it was like a house sublease, wasn't it as well that you had it from or um, oh yeah. from how, yeah how, H O U Z Z yeah, yeah yeah exactly so we subleased some some space from them yeah. and then we sub sub subleased it to you <laughs> exactly so it all goes around yeah it all it, that, that's why it's always important yeah. to keep good relations and yeah, yeah no it was really helpful for us yeah. because. In that time, there was a no notion of working from home yeah, or any of that. Exactly. So, so everyone- You had to have a Palo Alto office. It, exactly, course, you had yeah. to be in Palo Alto yeah. as well. And so, yeah, we we, yeah. We, we took office space from you and then we grew that business and yeah. then ultimately- It was a great exit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and ultimately Ford made a tr call to go 100% connectivity, which means they, all cars were gonna be connected because they realized the value of the data. So if, you, if you're driving a Ford today, you're using your software? A new Ford? Uh, yeah, well, the car is connected to the platform, mm -hmm. so all the telemetry coming off the vehicle is going into the platform. That's that amazing. Created. Yeah, yeah. It's, pre it's pretty exciting. And then, you know, when we finally um, kind of finished our time up at Ford, you know, these acquisitions work, you've been through it as well, you know, we were looking at different areas to build around, and one of the things that was really obvious to us was more and more data was being created, mm -hmm. but the ability to analyze it was getting harder and harder. 
and you know AI was starting to come around and it wasn't quite where it is today you know with and we'll talk more about that but like we're with gen AI but there was like the early early kind of inclinations of that and so we started to build a platform that could help people analyze blockchain data just with like natural language make it easier and then it became clear that like we should apply this technology everywhere and so that's how we ended up with definitive intelligence. Incredible. Well, yeah. it's it's uh, it's been a journey. I mean, you you've yeah. done so much, you've created so much um so many jobs and yeah. and so many um new products and services. I think like your your contribution to the tech industry has been amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a small piece like you sure. know like but what, it matters. Yeah, it I, matters. I, it, you know, we're in these different corners like we did apps and we did mm. like uh, kind of connected vehicle stuff. Yeah. But yeah, these are all pieces that build other things can build on top of. So so let's get into the meat of the conversation. Yeah. I mean, I think we were we were chatting before the show about you know, what would we have done differently? Oh yeah. Uh you know, in in our previous companies had we had AI available to us. So yeah. for a lot of the listeners today that like they're seeing you know, these old school, old world companies, which still exist. Like, yeah. You know, the, all my companies I founded are still around today. Yeah. They're not all using AI. Yeah. And they, you know, potentially could be disrupted by AI, um, you know, competitors or yeah. startups. So if you're trying to start a, a new company yeah. and you're trying to use AI, yeah. what would you do? How would you think about things? And let's yeah. use an example from the past. So look at uh, one of your previous companies, yeah. pick one, and let's delve into how you would use that. Yeah, and I'll do the same back to you, right? Because sure. you've been doing it. But like, uh, so let's just start with a concept, uh, which you know we have at at Definitive, which is like AI all the way down. Mm -hmm. I think like there's two approaches. There's the you can use AI at the edges, or you can use all the way through. And so, what I would do is like let's go look at let's say Extreme, mm -hmm. and so Extreme is building apps for folks, right? And so if you want to go AI all the way through your system, and I'll just kind of touch on like kind of bottoms up, I would say everyone be using a co-pilot. You know, I, I had a tweet last week where I had dinner with Farhan, which I think you've met yeah, with yeah. a couple of times. He's a VP of engineering Shopify, yeah. for Shopify. Yeah. Worked with us for a very long time. And he had just uh, had a, uh, did like a keynote at the uh, GitHub conference. Mm -hmm. And he said that, <clears throat> you know, Shopify has done 1 million uh, kind of lines of code written by co-pilot. It's incredible, right? And so I would say all the tools that the developers use would have like, you know, AI capabilities in them. I would do that. Next, I would say, you know, a lot of time is spent translating requirements from like a customer by a product manager into something for engineers. I would like cut that down because you can now have AI do that part for you. So you can have like really interesting product management type uh, functions uh, being automated through AI. And then like prototyping. So, you know, if you really think about um, the latest in, in, you know, the kind of gen AI technologies, you can even put like a sketch mm. and you can, or a screenshot of something and the AI can prototype that for you. So every step of the process can use AI and that's what, how I would go back and kind of mm. rebuild those businesses. And ultimately I think you'd get anywhere from like 10 to hundred X leverage out of each person that was there. Yeah. Yeah. But and about for you, like look back to yeah. one of your business. I'll look back at like my first company, Incubator, yeah, which um, is now owned by the Carlisle Group. Um, you know, it's still a big ad agency. Yeah. Uh, you know, it started off as a search marketing agency and uh, technology platform, and we built uh, a lot of you know SEM technologies that plug straight into Google AdWords, mm -hmm. uh, and you can manage accounts. And then we had lots of campaign managers. We had like, I mean, when I was running it. Uh, I had about 50 people in the company or 60 people in the company total and about half were campaign managers. And, and all campaign managers had to do was look at the data, write creative. Yeah. So they would write these ad, you know, the AdWords yeah. copy, you know, and, and then test lots of them. So, yeah. you know, and the rule was you had to have at least two or three pieces of ad copy yeah. per keyword just so you can make sure you're getting the best yeah. rates and continue, opti continue optimize it. I would just make AI do everything. everything. Run, run a hundred copies of each yes. for each keyword. Yeah. Like, you know, do the keyword research automatically. I could probably run the whole thing with like you could even feed it back and say these yeah. are doing well, exactly. make them even better. Exactly, and these were doing bad. So, so just work on making you know build yeah. an AI SCM agency. Yeah, uh, just for search Great marketing. Idea. Yeah, yeah. So there's an idea for someone out yeah. there who's listening. But yeah. that's the sort of stuff I, I think that AI can help with. Um, for me, AI is going to give us more time, mm -hmm. and I think there's two schools of thought around uh, AI and productivity. I think the one is that 
we can use smaller teams of people mm-hmm. to get the same job done. Yep. The other is that even if you have the same number of people, they don't have to work as hard on the jobs that they're currently doing. So people are going to save time. Yeah. So there's a trade-off. Companies can decide to lay off people or give them more benefits or let them do other types of work that's more beneficial to the company. Yeah. Um, so and I, I think that I think we're probably moving closer and closer to a world where everyone feels more comfortable with like a four-day week, mm. or, you know, as opposed to um, you know, five day weeks right now, two days weekend. And I think if, if AI can enable, and it's kind of, you know, people, you know, like us mm-hmm. who've hired and managed people for years, yeah. like, oh, you know, productivity is going to suffer. I think, you know, maybe, but if we can get people to be more productive using AI and only working four days a week instead of five, do we really care as business people running companies? Like, do we care if our, if our people are working less time but getting more done? It's a really good question. I think it's going to come down to, the stage and phase that a company is in. Like, you know, when you're in that early startup phase, sure. you're trying to get the most done mm-hmm. because your your resources are limited. Oh, absolutely. The main resource being money. Yeah. Right? And so in that case, you know, we're not we're not looking for a four day week. To- totally agree. Like on start on startups, yeah. maximum productivity for as long as possible to yes. get to escape velocity yeah. so you have a company that works. And totally if you're agree. not leveraging AI, you're gonna get killed yes. because a team of three people yeah. that or have it all the way through every area of their business is going to operate like a team of thirty people. Well, or, well and every and every startup and every startup I've invested in and, and, and having been in the industry for years, inv- investing in companies. Whenever you have an investment opportunity, there's already three other companies doing the same thing. Yeah, like I've never really found a good idea that's unchallenged yeah. by other people, and that's a good thing. Yeah. When others are doing, it's good. Yeah, right. But then the then it's the productivity curve. Yes. Which of the startups Execution. are the most productive? And sometimes you need more hours. Yes. But let's park startups to the side because a different beast. It's funded by venture capital. Yeah. You know, just regular companies. Yeah. Um, agencies. Uh, you know, small businesses. Yeah. And we're talking stuff where physical labor isn't yeah. the biggest input, right? So a coffee shop, people have to make the coffee, whatever. Like, sure. Put that aside. Yeah. But, uh, you know, any sort of white collar type work, if you can get the work done faster, do we think it's better to have, you know, more people working fewer hours or less people overall working, you know, five days a week? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. I would say less people working five days a week. Okay, you still yeah. you still think the five day week thing is? Yeah, yeah. I kind of feel like, you know, uh, until we get to a place where the day of the week can be automated, mm-hmm. the thing I struggle with with like the four day week or three yeah. day week, is well for the unless you have some kind of weird, you know, algorithm where like you know half sure. the people work three days, the other half work the other four days, and you swap. Um, it's because businesses are twenty four seven, and so, you know, even in our lifetimes, right, Vinny, we've. Or, or I guess the time of our careers, maybe in our lives, we've seen that like weekends is part of our work anyways. Because yeah. like you know our phone is yeah, on, we're yeah. answering emails. Sure. So I think it's about getting more done and not kind of cutting the hours back, but with like you know, being more efficient around that. That's well. Then yeah. should that lead, lead to increased pay for people? Yeah. Okay. So they, so then there's a trade off, right? Yeah. So if you're still working the five days, you're getting more done. You yeah. should get paid more as well. Yeah. I think that's okay. what we're gonna see. Okay. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And then at the business level. Something has to give. Yeah. And at the business, they're saying, okay, I've got, you know, whatever, 30% less people, mm-hmm. but I can pay these people. Well, you're making more profits. Exactly. Yeah, so then you, sh- yeah. you, know, you should be paying your people. Yeah. More. Okay. So, I mean, that's that's interesting um, angle, I think, on, on how AI improves productivity. Yeah. W- what about um, entrepreneurship yeah. and, and starting companies? How do you think AI improves the process? It's going to explode it okay. because- <clears throat> Think about what it takes. And like, you know, we've seen this interesting arc. In the 90s, what it took to create like a business, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, a bit more tech focused. And then in the 2000s, and now let's kind of start with now and look at the future. So now if you want to create a business, um, you could go to Shopify Mm -hmm. and it's a platform. And, you you know, Shopify has enabled, you know, millions of entrepreneurs, but um, there's still a barrier to entry there, right? And you know they made it quite simple. This is doing what Shopify did, but not for e-commerce, but for every area of business. And the way I th- think about this in kind of practical terms is when you and I learned to code, right? Like we did like a hello world. Sure. And like that was like, we got so excited. And that's everyone's path, right? And mm-hmm. But today's hello world in AI is not a hello world. It's like 
10 lines of code that's like a sophisticated application mm-hmm. that you're chatting with that is you know is reading documents and doing all that stuff and so there's been so much advancement at the base layer of what someone can accomplish with all the open source out there and all the APIs that exist from these foundational model companies that you're going to be you're going to see small teams produce incredible type results the same way that you were doing that via a platform before now you'll be able to do that with like you know um, the first principle primitives do you think it drops the capital requirements for companies yeah big time okay so now instead of having to raise a million dollars or two million dollars you can have a, a smaller team and have get more done so maybe you need a quarter million bucks so yeah I, I kind of agree with your thesis here this is going to lead to a proliferation of startups. Huge. And they're not all going to be AI startups. They're going to be startups using AI. Yes. And then that, and that's a very distinct difference. Everyone's expecting you know, all these AI startups. I think it's more about startups using AI yes. instead. And, and that's an important difference. It's yeah. a very important difference. The end user may or may not know how much AI was used to build it. Exactly. But the end user will see more things yeah. because you know those things will get released quite quickly now. Well, look at pair programming right now. Yeah. You don't need... You don't need to, two developers working together on, on, no, on a you code have a co-pilot. Base. You don't, yeah, exactly. You have co-pilot. Yeah. So you can move away from pair programming. You can basically double productivity by just using co-pilot, and if, if not more. Yeah. And, you know, that's one side of it. And then, you know, just sort of the capabilities, you can abstract so much away, so much complexity away, and let the AI handle it. And, like, going back to, you know, your writing copy or, like, you know, gen- like doing really advanced image recognition. Mm-hmm. These are just like simple API calls now. Well, actually, even even more so, customer support. Yes. I remember when I was running Gift, I was, I spent the one Christmas day answering 400 uh, wow. uh, you know, customer support tickets. Now, yeah. in the early stages of the company, I think it's important for founders to be, of course. have your finger on the pulse of yeah. it and answer these tickets. But what I think is going to happen is we're going to get to a point, and there's already, there's already tons of these products out there now that are leveraging AI. Big companies are going to be cutting jobs in customer support. Yeah. Because you can email an AI, it can email you back. You won't even know that you're not talking to a human. Yeah. And they're already doing this. Yeah. And it's able to just do things. Yeah. Uh, uh, and for it's you. getting better it's and it's getting, getting hyper personalized. Yeah, absolutely. I think like one thing that we've seen in previous eras is that personalization on a one to one basis didn't really exist. Like everyone would get, like if you'd create a model, like mm-hmm. a machine learning model, you'd put them into one of N categories where N could be anywhere from like 10 to 100, mm-hmm. but that's it. Now, you know, American, who's your go-to airline? Um, in the U.S., yeah. I go American Airlines. American, okay, yeah. yeah. So American Airlines very shortly should have customer service bots yeah. that know every preference about Vinny. Yes. So when you're chatting with it, they know, like, where you like to sit, and which seats you prefer, and which meals you like. And, like, that's all very possible now, yeah. which makes that experience even better than a human. It's going to be really incredible. And I think American Airlines is actually one of the most progressive airlines yeah. in, in America. So I don't think you're I don't think you're far off from that. Yeah. I mean, it can happen pretty soon. And just think about what that means, you know, for their business going mm-hmm. forward. And think about what it means for them to build this. Mm-hmm. It's quite, you know, you think before the most of the stuff's off the shelf. They don't well, have to that's build much exactly. Of it. There's companies I, I can't remember the name. There's a company that does uh, customer support, plugs in yeah. the LLM from OpenAI into your system, that ingests all your emails. Yes, because like think about it, some companies. American Airlines is a good example. Yeah. right? they've they've got decades of emails. Take yes. two decades of email support going yeah. through the system. Yep. The AI can come in, read all the emails, read all the responses, and start predicting what the responses should be for new emails Correct. coming in. And you can cut the, the, the workforce by 80% Correct. With, uh, yeah. with with just that. And uh, like, the, the, at least the customer support workforce. And you have the you know, you always have that disclaimer when you call in. Yes. Where you're like, oh, this is maybe recorded. recorded. Now the, the can, audio as well. The audio as well. So yeah. you can go back through Every interaction Vinny's ever had, and, and, and I don't know whether you've seen this new um, this new product. It's called Air Something, where you you're literally talking to an AI, but you don't realize it. They've done a really good job of it. Amazing! It's like generative yeah. AI, yeah. And it, it's you you can yeah. you think you're speaking to a customer service agent, for example, yeah. like a real human. Oh, I, yeah, I think I've, I, I Chat GPT has a version of this too now, yeah. where okay. you can put it in voice mode. Okay. So instead of like listening to like a podcast, mm-hmm. you can just turn it on. 
and just say, hey, let's talk about, okay. you know, wine. Yeah. And then basically it'll, you can just say, tell me about this region. Tell me about that region. And it'll yeah. just kind of walk you through it. So if you were yeah. starting an AI company today and yeah. you're 20-something, say 25 to 30-year-old, yep. and it's your first startup, what would you do? Yeah. Uh, I, Assuming it's AI or using AI. Yeah. I think what I would look at is multimodal Large, multimodal models. Mm. So those are ones that are not just for language, but they can look at images and voice and, te- you know, kind of um, the three different areas. And I would use that to help traditional businesses or try to disrupt traditional businesses, right? And so I read this idea the other day on Twitter. Uh, we can get credit afterwards. Mm. And it was really smart. There is... Um, you know, Walmart parking lots. One of their biggest challenges is if the lights go down, they tend to have like people get injured or you know, maybe get robbed or something. And if you could just look at that data all the time and realize like that's happened and take an action to have it fixed, you know, they don't have to deal with like so many cases, you know, of, um, you know, people getting injured in their parking lots. And so I think like there's so many applications now that you can dream up that were very hard to do before would require teams of 10 to 100 people to build that, you know, a two-person startup can build them. And so very hard technical problems from the past that have become almost trivialized in today's world. Mm. Interesting. What about you? Um, you know, it would depend. So so everyone's different. And I think if you're an entrepreneur that's trying to start a you want to build a billion dollar company. Yeah, it's a it's a lot harder to do, and you're know, raising capital and yeah. shooting the lights out is, is part of the game. So that's a, a Silicon Valley idea. But if you want a business that just makes some money, um, focus on uh, areas that you're passionate about. Yeah. So whatever you like, really feel yeah. affinity for. So like, I'll use for example, I I love search search marketing and yeah. I love doing that. So I would probably probably start a search type agency um, yeah. where we just used AI to produce tons of content. And, and, and see what works best and yeah. optimize for that. Um, just because my experience was that's a very good cash business. I mean, I started that company in my bedroom 2003. Yeah. It was, was profitable from day one, yeah. basically. But we had, we had ups and downs yeah. along the way, but I was making money. It's an easy business to make money because if you can just leverage your the number of hours you're able to put into a business using AI as a solo founder, it's, it's the returns well, are better than taking investment. Can I build on that a little bit, sure. maybe, and may, maybe modify my answer? There's so many businesses that you can do now without venture capital. Sure. Right? Like that. Where, you know, where before you're like, I don't know how to get this started. Yeah. You know, you can, one, you can just ask the AI for some tips. Yeah. And then two, you're like, I don't have a team. Well, you have like a unlimited team mm-hmm. now, right? You know, at 20 bucks a month for chat GPT, you have mm-hmm. as much help as you need. And so maybe there's a bigger push to just start something without raising venture capital, mm-hmm. but to build, you know, like something well, that's well, functional right away. Something I, I, I'd, I'd like to see more of is better recommendation engines. Okay. Because I think that there are a bunch out there. I mean, I'll give you an example. Vivino, right? Yeah. Vivino is pretty good. Yeah. But it's not it's not like yeah. perfect. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot of nuances in re- recommending yeah, wines. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, I, I pull up my Vivino app. I'll scan a bottle. I'll rate it. The problem with the rating system is like it's five stars or four stars mm-hmm. or three stars. It normalizes. So it normalizes. It, yeah, so, like, yeah. you know, so, like, I get recommendations for stuff, which is a 4.7 or 4.8. Yeah. Out of five, and, and uh, you know it doesn't quite work that way. It's not. Yeah. I don't think that the ranking system as well. So I think with with recommendation engines, yeah, it's really easy for someone who's just barely technical. You can write some code, or you get a co-founder who can. Yeah, you can build amazing recommendation engines on top of yes. something like OpenAI. Oh yeah, without having to do all the legwork. And I mean, yeah. look, look at someone like Vivino. They've had to capture and build. Uh, they, yeah. they, you know, they built a company over a decade trying to get really good at this, and this is before AI came along. So they would be a company which would be ripe for disruption yeah, yeah. with an AI version of uh, wine recommendation. And that's, that's a great just, idea. That's just wine. Yeah. Uh, the same would apply for books. I mean, yep. you've got like Goodreads, and a lot of this stuff is kind of, um, it's not AI driven. It's more people who like this book like this book. People who like this book, it's not AI. So it doesn't look into the themes of the book. Yeah. It doesn't look into the you know, movie recommendation as well. I'm pretty sure Netflix is using AI pretty extensively around for recommendations. Or, yeah. Yeah, they must have like caught onto that very quickly. Well, you know, they for years held a competition. I, right? they, they stopped it about a decade yeah, ago. Yeah, oh yeah, okay. Where yeah. they would mm-hmm. put it out for teams to, to yep. and they'd have a pretty decent prize, right? Like yeah. a, a million or $10 million. Um, 
And so, yeah, they, they moved that internal, right? I don't know when they stopped that. Yeah. But, so but, I wonder what they're doing internally now in AI. But I, I think there's a huge yeah. market opportunity for recommendation engines. Yeah. And you can build it as a GPT that you just plug, yeah. you know, you plug in, you can sell it in the marketplaces. Yeah. Um, I think there's these are the opportunities I think. I like that area. I think, I, I, it's a big area. Yeah. For and I think like the heavy lifting of recommendation engines is not needed anymore. And now it's like sort of like what, what, customization did you provide? What custom instructions did you provide to make it really good for wine or whatever it happened to be? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's let's talk about a little bit about crypto for a bit. Sure. Yeah. We got to. Um, we what, can't forget where we started. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've got our roots in crypto. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I've tried to stay clear of crypto on the show because everyone knows me, you know, from the crypto <laughs> world. Um, I know, but I think it's important just to touch on it. Like, yeah, B- Bitcoin just broke thirty-seven thousand today. Amazing. It's on the way on the way up. Yep. Um, and you know, I think um, it looks like we're in this recovery phase for crypto. Yeah. FTX has just dumped a lot of or most of their liquid tokens. Yeah. Uh, aggressively, uh, you know, Sam Bankman-Fried's going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so most likely yeah. sentencing. Yeah. I mean, he's going to jail. Um, and I think that we're out of this valley of despair in crypto. Yeah. And I think we're on the up and up. But it largely seems to be driven by macro factors. Yeah. And I want to just kind of jump into that for a bit. Um, you know, interest rates are at basically a high uh, we've ever seen. Yeah, in 20 our plus years. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, money's been drained from the economy. Excess savings is down 90% yeah. in the past year and a half. Yeah. But everything's going up. Yeah. And, and crypto in particular, Bitcoin is absorbing a lot of that cash. Uh, from people, you know, either worried about the state of the world's yeah. uh, capital, the, the, you know, the the answer that I think if you ask the experts, what they say is the stock market and the crypto markets are looking ahead six months. Yeah. Well, we saw right the CPI a couple of days ago, mm-hmm. right? That came in lower, and then that led to predictions by all the banks, uh, investment banks, saying, "Hey, we think that we'll start to see serious cuts." Uh, mm. Early next year, yes, and then right. and that's factoring into the market. I think right? that's like then people get ahead yeah. of that. So when banks are cutting, and I'm talking about you know reserve banks, when they when they're cutting rates, and we we're projecting six months out, the market responds to it now. Yeah, it's, it's always there's always this lag, right? Yeah, and so what we're seeing is a lot of capital flying into uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, and then some into maybe a little bit of Ethereum. Yeah. And then, you know, we're having a bit of an altcoin run yeah. as well. Well, Bitcoin is also has the ETF ruling. E- ETF right? is coming soon, and, yeah. and potentially uh, for for ETH as well. SEC's yeah, he's delayed until next year. But yeah, the, you know, the, so these become basically yeah. buckets for cash, and 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 I guess the point I'm trying yeah. to make is we have this loose monetary policy coming in now. Yeah, we're in a tight monetary policy environment right yeah. now. You know, five percent, five and a half percent rates. Yeah, um, we're going to move to a loose one. So. Is the market predicting or factoring in some sort of um, you know, excess inflation to come in when, when, when the banks drop rates and therefore people are buying Bitcoin? Well, can I ask one kind of question that builds into that, which sure. is, and you brought this up before with respect to Bitcoin mm-hmm. and sort of the vehicles that existed before. Is there enough Bitcoin out there that can fulfill the demand if these ETFs are stood up? Not at the current price point. Okay. So, so that's the market saying, okay, if an yeah. ETF goes. And let's explain to our viewers why an ETF uh, matters. And for those of you listening, yeah. it's a it's an exchange-traded fund. Yes. So in other words, you don't have to buy the Bitcoin, hold the Bitcoin yourself. You can just buy the fund yeah. through your Robinhood account that makes it accessible. Yeah. But why is this important? I mean, you know, you, you'd ask. Um, a lot of people have retirement accounts, 401ks yep. in the U.S. And, uh, and similar around the world. Uh, but but in, in America particularly, if you can go buy Bitcoin with a retirement account and not have to you know buy an ETF, yeah, you can basically get um, you know tax free returns for until retirement on that ETF. You can kind of trade in and out yeah. of it. You can buy it. You can sell it. And what about the account. holding requirements like versus GBTC, um, and you know, and then an, e- an ETF Bitcoin? Like how is that different? GBTC would have to convert into an ETF once there is an ETF. Yeah. Um, and I think it's trading as a premium right now. Yeah. Um, it went under for a bit. Yeah, now, for a long time. Yeah, right. Now it's back up. Well, so. the premium is what was at the core of a lot of the crypto boom for the last, you know, in 2020, 2021, right? Was that premium that mm. existed between G- 
GBTC yeah. and the price of Bitcoin. And that's why guys like, you know, we had this big collapse of yeah. portfolio and... Yeah, because um, people were taking uh, uh, that and just, you know, mm. trading from that. There was a natural arb yeah. there. I said block folio, I meant... Um, What's the lending? Uh, BlockFi. Yeah, BlockFi. Block yeah. Yeah, and Celsius yeah. and BlockFi and all that. Yeah, I mean, everyone was involved in this yeah, at yeah. the core. Yeah. Anyone who's lending. Okay, so let's talk about the outlook for crypto over the next year. So, yeah. uh, you know, it, it looks like we're entering a, a bull market for crypto. Yeah. So, the, w the indicator I use the most when I look at these things is I look at the lows yep. in a cycle, and okay. the, the low was like 14K when when uh, FTX went, you know, went, went bang. Yeah. Um, and then I look at double the low, which is okay, 28K. 28K. So we've cleared 28K. Okay. Then I look at around 60% of the previous high, okay. which is about 37, 38K. Okay. So once you, you know, wow. okay. you know, so I always look at the 20, like, so in this yeah. case, 28 to 38K range yeah. to be like, you know, who knows what happens. Yeah. But the moment you clear that, yeah. uh, that so let's say we go over 40K and we hold it, we're now into the the sort of the recovery phase of the next wow. bu bull run. Okay. Um, and so I, I personally think we're we're we're, we're heading there. I, yeah. I think that the halving's coming in four or five months time. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's almost inevitable that we go through another bull cycle. Yeah. But Bitcoin, I think, like I can get my head around what's driving it. Yeah. But let's talk about some other ones where you know you've had good expertise and sure. you've been around Solana and Filecoin. Yeah. Right, because we're not hearing about an ETF for those things, and what's driving? Because there's been a huge recovery in Solana. Yeah. Right. So, let, let, so we'll talk about Solana in a second. Yeah. Let, let's just let's just talk about the the market of crypto. Yeah. You know, I, I, my conviction is very high yeah. for a few coins yeah. and very low for lots of coins. Got it. Because I think this long tail of crap is not going to get us anywhere as yeah. an industry. Yeah. It's mostly just a grift. And I don't think uh, outside. Highly speculative. Highly speculative. Yeah. So if you had asked me how many coins I think are probably interesting, yeah. maybe 50 out okay. of 10,000. Well, I'm surprised you said yeah. 50. Yeah, maybe 50 out wow. of 10,000. I thought you were going to say fewer. It's No, no, interesting. Yeah. How many do I personally would be invested yeah. in? Yeah. Maybe 10 or 20. Yeah. That's like what's a very, yeah. very small number. Yeah. Um, and, and, and all my favorites, obviously, Solana, you know, which I was an early yeah. an investor in, and, uh, and Filecoin as well, uh, and Render. Render, um, yep. And so I think these are coins that are interesting because it's thematic, right? Yep. So um, both Filecoin and Render are working on distributed compute capabilities. Yep. So the ability to store data or do compute you know, yeah. on, on a distributed grid. Yeah. Uh, Solana is doing something very similar as well. Uh, but, but Solana competes more with Ethereum as a layer layer one alternative. Yeah. I don't think we're going to have 50 layer ones in the yeah. world that work. Yep. I think we're going to have less than 10, probably closer to five. Yeah. You know, um, and Solana is becoming the kind of system of record for things like Render and other. Uh, exactly. Well, right? So Render just moved across to Solana yeah. recently. So yeah. I, I think there's um, there's a lot of positive things that can happen for a few coins. So what that, what that means for me though is the Bitcoin dominance. So for those of you listening who aren't in, really into crypto that much, yeah. Bitcoin dominance is the percentage of the total market cap of crypto that Bitcoin yeah. sort of yeah, holds. Yeah. Um, and in the previous run, it went as low as. 30 something percent, yeah. 31, yeah. 32 percent, very low. And what we've seen is a lot of the crap has been sort of washed out. Yep. And Bitcoin's now rising to 50, 52, 53 percent. It's been as high as 54, I think, recently, 54, 55. Yeah. I think we're gonna see we're gonna see Bitcoin and and, and I think it's healthy yep. that Bitcoin maintains a dominance of over 50%, yeah. maybe 55%, uh, plus median 60. And that all the other speculative things, you know. Uh, between Ethereum, uh, Solana, maybe a few others, maybe they hold like 30 or 40%. Yep. Um, and then the risk sits in a very small percentage. So it's kind of like risk on, if you want to take a gamble on some some team building something, maybe you take a chance, maybe it's the next Solana. But, Got it. But, um, you know, most of, the, the, most of the, 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 the value in crypto needs to go into uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, uh, I am a big fan of Filecoin as well, yep. Render, and there's a few others probably on that list. But yeah. I, you know, I just don't see a world where we go through this this bull run where everything goes up and we all get stupid again. Yeah, I, but, I but, but you know, it's it's happened before, so it'll probably happen again. It, it, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of agree with you. I I think, look, the minute U.S. regulators are allowing you know a Bitcoin ETF. It says a lot about crypto and an Ethereum ETF and, 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 and an Ethereum yeah. ETF, right? So I think that's talking about there's a new generation of folks plus existing folks that want to use that as a store of value, right? And so that's really I think it's a good sign for mm -hmm. the broader crypto ecosystem, yeah. right? 
I think what you mentioned with everything that happened with FTX and cleaning all that out and that's a you know that was a very toxic thing when you when you look backwards right mm -hmm. how much of what was happening was being driven by you know what they had going on with customer funds and driving up values of random coins both blue chip and not blue chip so i yeah. think less of that's happening in the ecosystem well, too. Well, you know, the big grift in crypto that happened in 2022 and 2021 was, yeah. you know, between three arrows, uh, Celsius, yeah. um, you know, FTX, uh, FTX BlockFi, yeah. all, all collapsing. Yeah. Billions were stolen from the crypto community and spent on things like, you know, Boats, planes, yeah, uh, mansions, yeah, you know, uh, and you know, stadiums, and just moving, st stadiums, yeah, you and, know? yeah, and moving. But the, it left the crypto economy and went into the real world economy. Yeah. You think about that, like yeah. that money was was circulating in the crypto economy. It just left, yeah. And what we're finding now is that the prices collapsed to a point where people f saw value and money from the real world moved back, back into crypto. In. Yeah, and so now we're having this rising effect. And I think the having for Bitcoin is very powerful. Yeah, um, cut supply. Uh, I think we should see Bitcoin at 100,000 by, uh, and uh, you know, it's not a prediction, but I think by you know, middle of next year. Wow. Um, you know, I, okay. I think I think it'd be I think it'd be very um, possible that we're there. A at the very least, at the latest, I'd say by end of next year we're at 100k. Now, when I say 100k, I don't mean 100k exactly. I mean yeah. in that range. So say give or ten, take ten thousand. So wow. maybe 90k to 110, 120. Well, it just the ETF I think is going to drive it and. And, mm -hmm. you know, the amount of demand that yeah. ETFs can create because it's everyone. Yeah. It really opens it up to every single sure. investor that's out there. But it's not going to go to 300K or 400K, which some people are predicting. Yeah. I, like law of large numbers, the size of the economy is relatively. Yeah. I just don't see it going there anytime yeah. soon. I think the, the next run's probably a three, you know, two or three X. Uh, max. Yeah. Uh, the 3X would be like 180 on the previous all time high. Yeah. But I think we're probably looking for a double. So yeah. looking from 60 something to 120 ish wow. as a peak, uh, which would be great. Yeah. I mean, it's great. And yeah. then the world has to, has to digest that and figure out. But to your point, there isn't enough Bitcoin in the world right now if these vehicles take off and yeah. people are piling cash in. Yeah, which I think is going to drive the price way up mm. in a weird way. So how should we think about that? There's two outcomes I see. Um, in the next year, one is we hit the sixty-six to sixty-eight k range, yeah, and it goes back down, yeah. So it's known as a triple top, uh, where there's just so much resistance above sixty-eight k that people sell and say I'm done and and get out, and the price collapses. And maybe I got up. in at the fourteen k. I'm up at sixty. Exactly. I'm good with my exactly four x four x exactly. Yeah. So, so so that that's the one outcome I see. Yeah. Uh, if it breaks past 68K, goes 72K plus, then it's yeah. going to run to 90, yeah. 120, who knows? You know, I saw a crazy stat mm -hmm. that said every, every holder of Bitcoin right now is in the money. Yes. Well, it, not exactly, because Bitcoin was trading at 68K. Yeah, but maybe those people got out. Cost average. Or whatever, yeah. yeah. Isn't uh, that? No, no, I think the stat was the average The average holder is Oh, is it? Money. Yeah. Okay. Because it looks at the average price of Bitcoin paid over a period of time. Okay. Because it's volume weighted as well, so you have yeah. less trade happening at, at that point in time. Yeah. Um, Still a, a ridiculous kind of. No, so I think it's very bullish that yeah. people, people are going to hold. So here, here's my advice to people who are busy um, figuring out how to play this market. Just do a cost average buy-in. Yeah. So, so you can do it for a couple of coins, um, but for Bitcoin, uh, just a weekly a weekly recurring yeah. order, whether it's a hundred bucks or five hundred yeah. bucks, whatever you want to put in. Can I more. share? You were telling me last night yeah. that you have a, you have that happening. I right? do. Yeah, yeah. I have that happening, and yeah. it's performed very well. Yeah, and you know you, you have to put in enough that it, it's meaningful, but not yeah. so much that you skate to sell. Yeah. So when Bitcoin dumped like a while ago, I was like, ah, eh, you know, I'm just gonna hold it and, and just yeah. and because I keep buying, it just brings it's my cost, cost average, average down. Yeah. So so it's more of a long term investment strategy. Yeah. And don't put again, don't put in too much. Put in something. Yeah. And then if you want, if you, you know, and then when you have gains in Bitcoin. I tell people, well, if you have a lot of gains in Bitcoin, you're like a little nervous, yeah. Or, or you're just getting, hey, you know what? I want to get some gains and like, try something else. Then you can sell that and go buy some Ethereum, Solana, Filecoin, Render, whatever else you you're interested in. Yeah. Um, but rather use profits from Bitcoin gains to invest in altcoins, okay. Than putting your cash into altcoins. Yeah. 
So you're kind of playing with the house's money. Play house's money. Yeah. And, and you're gearing up your returns that way. Yeah. I think that's the safest bet because, and then don't like dump all your Bitcoin. You go, yeah. just, like, just shave off like 10% of the top and go yeah. re- redistribute into other things. Yeah. But it's it's always better to do it with profits. And because you keep running this this accumulator where you just keep putting in money every single week, yeah. um, it, uh, you know over time builds up to some healthy balance. The mistake I see too many people make in crypto today is you come in and you go buy a portfolio of garbage yeah. generally and you don't pick well and yeah. you go buy you know maybe 10 percent bitcoin five percent ethereum one yeah. percent solana and a whole bunch of other things and, yeah. then, and then you get like 50 or 100 you know crappy coins in your portfolio yeah. and it doesn't do very well right well and it's not you got to have a good base it, for your portfolio a lot of times that's like speculating exactly it's but, gambling yeah and then they yeah. lose their shirts so then like yeah. i'm not touching crypto again yeah 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 you yeah, know yeah. and, and and look, you know, you can change, you can chase the Doge coins of the world, yeah. and I think actually Doge is pretty good. Actually, yeah. what are your thoughts on Doge? Let's go there for a second. And given the Elon yeah. sort of uh, yeah, I mean, like, look, like, I think like high level, he's made it very clear that there's no tie-in to any cryptocurrencies with anything that he's doing, mm-hmm. right? So I think you know he's said that several times. Um, look, I keep coming back to. Um, if you're going to do something at scale with a cryptocurrency, there is some technical fundamentals that have to be achieved. Mm-hmm. And and I think like some of the newer, um, you know, technologies like Solana mm-hmm. enable that. Yes. But, you know, you don't really see that in something like Doge. Right. Yeah. And especially where there's just not been a lot of improvement in the network mm-hmm. in, in a long time. And I think they've the Doge community has struggled overall a little bit with kind of direction. And um, I haven't, you know, they put a few things out in the last couple of years, but nothing substantial mm-hmm. enough. So so you don't think he's going to put Doge into Twitter anytime soon or X? I, I mean, I'm just going off of what he said yeah. directly, which is there is no plans for any type of cryptocurrency mm-hmm. to be part of. He just likes the memes. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Like mean, what well, the most obvious answer is that answer, yeah. right? Like I think he just likes it. It's fun. Yeah. It would be, you know, it'd be funny that if like something like Doge became like that, yeah. but, they, but I don't think he's going to make that happen. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that's, um, I think that was like a little bit unfortunate for the ecosystem because mm-hmm. it, it rode that quite high. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I feel like he's done a good job of calling out like why. Well, Barry Silbert killed the run. If you remember, yeah, br- break that down because so like, yeah. when Doge went on that big run in 2021, yeah. Barry Silver went on Twitter and says, "Okay, Doge, t- you know, party's over." Yeah, and he basically put on a huge short, short. and he shorted all the way down. Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm I'm assuming he covered his short at some point. Yeah, not not sure where, but he probably covered it. Yeah. Um, and the real, I guess, the real question is: Was well, like, going down? It's easy to cover. Yeah, no, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 but I'm saying before DCG yeah. went through there. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think they have those liabilities on the books, but yeah. who knows? But that was interesting because, like, I think because it's such a broadly distributed, you know, uh, asset, he had to go put up a balance sheet that he had at Genesis to go yeah. short it. And I, I think it's, I think it's generally hard to short Doge yeah. unless you have a big balance sheet yeah. and wanting to go and play play the play the game there. Yeah, uh, on a run up. Yeah. So it was interesting that he actually he was the guy who crashed it. Yeah. Yeah. Not surprising, right? Yeah. Because like they have such a good view of. Everything that's happening there, yeah, but, but it's 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 fascinating, yeah. Like I, I think on it, I look. My feeling is it's got a really strong community, mm-hmm. right? We know a bunch of people that are building in and mm-hmm. around that ecosystem, yeah. but I think the crossover to utility is still lower. It is lower. Yeah, you know? it's got scaling issues. Yeah, which hasn't been resolved yet. Yeah. Um, okay, let's let's go and. Pick um, one more cr- crypto, which is Filecoin. Yeah, which I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of. Filecoin has changed dramatically over the past couple of years. Yeah, um, and what what they've really done is so you know people look at Filecoin's fully diluted values. Yeah, and say, well, you know, it's two billion coin structure. But if you actually look at the inflation that's happening in the network right now, it's actually very low. It's like seven okay. percent, I think, a year. Okay, um, it's reasonably low, and the inflation that you see and the fully diluted values is something that unlocks in like 10, 15, 20 years from now. Okay. So it's not short-term inflation, it's long-term inflation and only unlocks when the network gets to massive scale. Okay. Which, for to do that, needs to have lots of revenues and people using it, et cetera. Got it. So I'm pretty bullish on Filecoin in the short term. And yeah. I think that we're seeing the you know the prices up quite sharply well, recently. you shared something interesting also last night, which I think is, is worth talking about because it comes back to this 
notion of like actual utility. Mm -hmm. And I think what you were saying is like some portion of Wikipedia is stored on Filecoin. Yeah. Right? Um, so they're using um, IPF S and Falcon, as far as I know, to to actually circumvent censorship in certain countries. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Yeah, and so like that's real utility. Yeah, and so, and especially in everything we're seeing, even driven by X, right? Mm -hmm. About like you know all the Twitter files released and mm -hmm. how you know things were manipulated by governments. Well, I love the sense of resistance nature of Falcon. Yeah, and just you know data being stored anywhere, no one can prevent the data from being stored and accessed. Yeah. Yeah, um, which is a big issue with the the privacy state, uh, well, the state of privacy, I should say, yeah. in the world. Like, yeah. it's really hard to control your your data. So that's like a real use mm -hmm. case, right? Because I think for for the everyday user, there's some amount of mm -hmm. that, but like, you know, you're probably okay with your G drive or your yeah. Dropbox or something. Yeah. But I think for some of these businesses that are operating at huge scale, mm -hmm. um, having that available to them is like really, really valuable and powerful. Yeah. And like to hear that, that was awesome. Like I, I thought like that's a good use case. Like they should talk about that more often. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to cover a couple of things with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the questions I've got for you is, is, um, you know, how do you think, how do you think budding entrepreneurs should think about venture capital? Because someone has taken it multiple times. Yeah. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are scared about it. They yeah. they don't want VCs to own the whole business. You're not a VC, you're an entrepreneur. You've yeah. taken yeah. millions in venture capital before and you've yeah. been successful at yeah. deploying and making capital returns. Yeah. How do you think they should think about it in the current paradigm? Yeah, I think the, the last point there is what I'll kind of circle around. I think in the current paradigm, which is you know higher interest rates and huge advancements when it comes to um, like AI creating productivity gains. I think venture capital has a important spot in it, but what happened over the last five years was what what used to be like a million to $2 million seed round became a $6 million seed round. And the A round, which was like, you know, five or $6 million became a 20 plus million dollar A round. Round of inflation. Ex exactly. And so I think, for entrepreneurs, it's important to take capital because it helps you grow, but it's important to, you know, take the appropriate amount that lines up to realistic valuations. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there right now that took capital at really high valuations that, you know, will never get their, mm -hmm. will never be able to return money beyond like a, like a stack of preference that's above them. Yeah. And so... Someone once told me and one of the best bits of advice I've received in raising capital, raise as little as possible at the lowest possible price yeah. for each round. And that turned around. As opposed to raising as much as possible the, at the highest yeah. possible price. But in price. the last five years, that's all it was about, yes. right? It was go get as much yeah. as you can at, at the highest possible, possible price. price, yeah. And you pay the price because yeah. you basically invest all your time and effort building the company. And then yeah. when it comes to an exit, you can't get one because you've priced yourself out the market. Yeah, or you may get one and you won't get anything for it, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, I, I really like that. I, I think I'm going to use that one too. The le for entrepreneurs in the day of AI, the least amount of money at the lowest, at the lowest possible valuation. Yeah, um, yeah and I, I like investing in entrepreneurs that are doing that. Yeah. Um, what you know, you've also been an angel investor. Yeah. You've done you know SpaceX, uh, <laughs> yeah. Notion. I mean, that's yeah. huge. Uh, what are you, what are you looking for when you make those checks and invest in a startup? There's usually like three factors, right? The first and most important is like just a great entrepreneur. Because most ideas will change mm -hmm. over time. Yep. And so I like, you know, that's the first thing. If I meet someone or it, it's that, uh, that's like a big factor for me. The next is like sort of like social validation. Like, you know, some of like SpaceX, like some great folks that we know are collectively involved mm -hmm. there. So, hey, like smart people are investing. You want to follow smart people. Mm -hmm. Same way people do it in public markets, you should do it in the private markets, right? And then the last is like areas that like, I can be passionate about where it's like, I really like what's happening there. Like I'm invested in this company called uh, Build Casa. And what they do is they, they're they helping um, property owners take advantage of, you know, the new regulations in California around lot splitting mm -hmm. for creating like- uh, ADAs and stuff. Yeah. Exactly, ADUs and, um, ADUs, yeah. 
um, and, and like to create more affordable housing. Yeah. I think that's like a real important thing. Like, you know, California, very expensive real estate. We were just talking yeah. about it. And so for uh, have the ability to do that, to create ADUs, to create more affordable housing, that's a real problem and I, I care about it. And I, I think we should see more of that happen. That's Those great. are the things that I really you know search for. You know, as someone who has built and led successful teams, like what's your approach to mentorship? How do you encourage professional growth in people? What's your, how do you mentor people? I think in order to, to mentor people, you yourself have to have some good mentors. Right. And so who is your mentor? Yeah. Well, I've got, a, you know, a couple of different people. So Yogan Dalal, you know, he was uh, one of the co-creators of TCPIP with okay, uh, wow. with Vint Cerf. OG. Yeah, 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 definitely. And, um, you know, ran Mayfield for a long time. Okay. All right. Um, you know, definitely he's very helpful. How and, old is he now? Um, he's got to be in his like late 60s. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so. Um, he's very helpful, calm. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's been through so many cycles, yeah, yeah. right? And and you know, Xerox Park, like every, yeah. everything that been important, been in and around Apple and Steve Jobs. And so, getting advice from someone who's kind of been through um, kind of time and battles is super invaluable. Yeah. And then once you see that, that's what I try to take for folks that I'm trying to help. Is that just look. We're getting older every year now, right? Mm-hmm. There's a young, you know, group of folks out there that were born when we started our careers, mm-hmm. right? And so we have the battle scars of the late '90s, early 2000s, the mid, you know, 2010s, and now. And so I try to take that same approach of like just giving the history to folks mm-hmm. based on what I've seen and um, things. And a lot of people don't know the history. Mm-hmm. Like you'd be really surprised, you know, you go to like a younger team of you mm-hmm. say you know 23 24 year olds new grads mm-hmm. they don't know what the dot com crash was yeah. other than like a wikipedia article yeah. but like we lived we it lived, we lived, we lived it, it yeah. right and That's so yeah. yeah so sharing that you know the from learnings. that perspective is really valuable okay what's your favorite book that you recommend to our, our viewers and listeners yeah so you know i just read this one so at the the um, all in summit mm-hmm. Uh, they had Graham Cod- the coddling Al- of the American mind. No, uh, no, uh, Graham Allison. Okay, um, you know he was there, and he uh, just in a private conversation um, was talking about. Well, someone else was talking about like he's written this book about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, okay. It's a really ac- and it's about really? like decision making. Okay, well we'll put the lo- link in there. Yeah, in the show notes. so it, I and so I hadn't read it before, and I read it because I heard about yeah. it there in a conversation. I want to read and this it's, now. Yeah, and it's it's about like decision making mm. in those pressure, in pressure in, moments in pressure moments oh, that's yeah. amazing okay yeah i'm definitely down for that yeah um what's your go-to habit you think everyone should implement in their daily routine um i've not been good at it for the last six months because i hurt my knee playing basketball <laughs> i think you were there last time <laughs> I but, wasn't there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. uh but you know working out man i think you got to start your day mm-hmm. with some form of you have to start your day being sore yeah if you're not sore from the previous day, you did not work hard, hard enough. Yeah. Like, so, I wake up some days where I am really yeah. sore from the gym. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like health is wealth. Health yeah. is everything. And so you really have to, um, you know, if you're speaking. If By the way, this is the most work, common answer I get. Yeah. It, 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 this is like everyone who's on my show yeah. says that. When yeah. you ask them what's the habit, it's, it's almost invari- invariably yeah. Yeah, uh, be f- and, fit and honestly, like do it in the mornings. Yeah, because like I think you get the benefit. You get, you, you get tired there on the day as well, and you get, and you, and get, you get, the, the you get the burn. You get exactly. Yeah. So you get get to sleep early. It's yeah. like everything just works better. I don't know. How, I used to train at night when I was younger. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, was people, I, I can't how, even I don't imagine know how people do it now. Yeah. It's like she's yeah, I'm crazy. Okay, yeah. I was doing it during COVID, mm-hmm. but like it was because it was weird times. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. What's the best bit of financial advice you've ever received that you want to share? Um, compound interest. Yeah. Like, honestly, people search for all kinds of, um, you know, high flyers, yeah. venture yeah. investments, angel investments. But the simp- if you just, just understanding compound interest yeah. and getting into investments that don't look super sexy can really, you know, create mm-hmm. a stable base for you, even if you don't have a lot of capital. Yeah. Right. It's just watching something grow. And in today's environment, with like very high interest rates provided by government backed mm-hmm. securities, I'd say, you know what? If you can lock in a 5% yeah. um, return or 7% return on some of these instruments out there, do it. it adds powerful, up Einstein rate. said it's the most powerful force in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, <clears throat> and everything else is great. Yeah. 
but build off a base of compounding interest. Yeah, compound interest is is. Uh, I mean, we're at five six percent right now. It's actually pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. If you right. can build off a base of that, a rule of seventy two, you'll the, double it in you know six. Or, uh, we might not com- get it. Compound interest is basically the notion of having money work for you. Yes, and <laughs> and like you that that's applied. You know, yeah. In, in 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 practice. Yeah. Um, give me a common misconception about business that you think is totally misunderstood. I think a lot of people think as you get more successful, your business is more successful, it's easier, it's harder, mm. right? There's more pressure, there's more to do. So, you know, my parents always kind of say this yeah. to me, it's like, oh, you know, you've done all this, like how can you work so hard? But it's it's just, what I think of it is like a series of escalators. Mm. And so you kind of get to the top of one, but then there's another one oh, yeah. and you get on the next one. But right? at some point you have to pull the, the rip cord. You, you do, yeah. you do. Like, that's kind of my, my my vibe right now. Like I've got, you know, I don't I don't want to be working my whole life. Yeah. Uh, at some yeah. point I'm going to just say I'm done. Yeah. And that's why I started the podcast. Yeah. I want to I have people like you on talk about <laughs> yeah. these things. And yeah. at some point when I'm done, I'm like, hey, there's my, you know, there's a bit of a legacy for me. You yeah. can watch all the conversation I've had yeah. and realize why I pulled the ripcord. <laughs> well, you know, but you know what you're really good at, Vinny, is like, you are finding um, kind of enjoyment through passion and you're passionate about mm-hmm. this stuff. Um, you know, others find passion in like golf or, or something mm-hmm. like that. I think I'm still searching for some, yeah. some of those things, but what I would, what what is, I think, important is you can't just stop doing something mm-hmm. because then, you know, yeah. idle mind is, you know, devil's, devil's playground. Workshop, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but like, you know, finding something else that you're passionate that you can put, like, you know, I, was, I was talking about this <clears throat> with, uh, with Gavin this morning, right? And I think you might have him on in a few future episode. Um, you really kind of double clicked into wine, mm-hmm. not that long ago, right? Like a couple of years. Yeah, it's like yeah. you know three five years ago, right? But like when you did it, you did it with passion, mm. and like <clears throat> you're good at it now. Yeah. Like it's not like uh, you know the same kind of thing as you when you're building a company, like. Yeah. You get access to great wines yeah. and you understand it all and you create experiences around it. So I think like doing things that way is really cool. I, yeah, thank you. I, I, it's, yeah. it's just, I, I, it's the way I am, right? When I when I go into crypto, I went deep into yeah. crypto. When I, when I get into anything, I just go deep yeah. into it. Like right now I'm into like, well, for a couple of years now, supplementation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 I gave you some 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 good stuff uh, last night. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and you know the, the science behind the stuff is amazing. Yeah. Like, it's like really really good. Yeah. Um, uh, and I take I, I, don't know, I think I take about 50, 60 pills a day. Oh, that's probably of a lot. That's yeah, a I'll, lot. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I got to get your list. I'll, I'll show you my list. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually gonna publish the list. I'll probably do a future episode talk about what I'm what I'm taking yeah. right now. And it's things like NMN and. You're a lithium and wow. fatty okay. fifteen yeah. and all, all the other. If vitamins. it's anything like the thing you gave me, like, like, so it wasn't like it's. It, it wasn't a drug. Like, it wasn't it was, a drug. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> we had a bit too much wine yeah, last yeah, night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It kind of sounded like, oh man, you gave me some good stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, so, so for yeah. you know, uh, uh, it's a stuff called After Party by yeah. uh, Michaela Peterson from Fuller Health. Yeah. And we had we opened up like four bottles of wine last yeah. night with a couple maybe of us. More, yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. <laughs> and a bottle and, of champagne. And you know, and we didn't have hangovers no. this morning. So yeah. we each took three of these pills. It's it's uh, it's meant to yeah. help break down the acetaldehyde and and, yeah. you know, and and not give you a hangover. And we woke yeah. up this morning and we're like totally fine. Yeah. I, mean, I know, literally sent it on all my WhatsApp chats. Okay. Like to you know. My, Hope you gave me credit. Yeah. No, I did. I, like, I, I was like, <laughs> this is amazing stuff. Yeah. 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 So shout out to Michaela Peterson yes, for a really great product. Fuller Health uh, Fuller and Health After amazing. Party. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Well, yeah. Sunny, it's really been great having you today. Oh, it was and awesome. We'll, I'm sure we'll do it again soon. Yeah, we should. Yeah, Great. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks congratulations on this and the studio and the setup and everything. It's really fun. Yeah, great. great. Thanks, man. <laughs>